something wrong with Daddy. Is my husband going to jail? You're going to jail. You're going to jail. Officer, what were you thinking? Am I in trouble? Tony, he said everything is going to be fine. I don't think you get it. The way you treat me and ignore your son, you'd think that we were the ones who put you up for adoption. You know, you really need to think about what comes next for you in this life. I decided I'm not gonna drink anymore. It's not worth it. I'm so proud of you. Thanks. Next. I'm here tonight with Steve Mason, and not only did he live eight, he wrote it. <laughs> World premiere. Congratulations, this is a big night for you. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. How are you? I'm very good, I'm very good. Thank you, have a wonderful turnout. Yeah, we're excited. Now, I was very moved by your story because it is heart-wrenching, yeah. but you also want good to come out of this. Absolutely. Explain to our audience what happened. Uh, so the story is based upon my father's last month or so of his life before he committed suicide. And uh, as fate would have it, I found the body uh, being eight years old, hence the title of the film. And, uh, you know, it, it is a, it's not an isolated story. Uh, we're trying to bring the topic of suicide awareness out so people can more openly talk about the things that are, uh, that are not comfortably talking about right now. So that's what we're using the film, uh, Art for Therapy. And, uh, you know, it was very cathartic for me to, to make the film and to write the film and co-direct it and co-produce it and all the other titles that I had on the film. But at the same time, you know, we're here and my vulnerability is hopefully going to help to save other people and to have them be more comfortable in their approach toward talking about these subjects that have been taboo. Now, your father was a veteran, and he also worked for the police department. Do you find that uh, there's a higher percentage of suicides in, in that, in that doubt. group of people? Without a doubt. I, I mean, there's a high rate across the country and across the world right now in all walks of life, but it is particularly high, law enforcement and those with substance abuse issues and those um, you know, that are vets that are dealing with uh, any type of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Yeah. Now, I, I would imagine that you found your father at eight years old, that you've carried this with you your whole life. Absolutely. Now, did you find that writing the story was, was some kind of a relief for you? Is, is there any kind of a change between before you wrote the movie and now? Yeah, I thought I had processed all the emotions. I really did. And uh, from the very uh, the inception of writing it to filming it, playing my father in the movie, uh, really helped me to understand that I haven't fully processed it. So it's a continual process. I've been carrying it with me 35 years and it very well may carry on or, or it'll work itself out. You know, that's I, I did this as, as a means for therapy. You know, in a way it's kind of brave of you because a lot of families hide the fact that there was a suicide in the family. Don't you feel that way? Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons that the, real, the film needed to be made. You know, to, to give an opportunity and a platform for people that are dealing with these types of issues, whether it's internally or if they're survivors of it or survivors of people who have attempted it, we need to talk about it. As a society, we're so wrapped up in ourselves that we forget to see how the person next to us is doing, whether it's our partner or our spouse or our child. You know, we're, we're wrapped up in other things and we're not paying attention to what, what matters. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, sometimes people feel that they're to blame when someone in the family does yeah. commit suicide. Sure. Did you did you feel that way? Did you carry a guilt with you? I didn't. You didn't. No. And and it is very typical that people will uh, and and the circumstances. I wasn't supposed to. I was supposed to be home when it happened, so my family was very uh, uh, bent on getting me into therapy to deal with that because they thought guilt would be the one thing I would have to deal with. And um, I somehow knew that it didn't matter whether I was there, if he wanted to do this, that he would have done it there the next day in his car. It had nothing to do with me. Right, right. So, so it's much deeper than the, the immediate circumstance. There was an immediate circumstance that almost triggered what your father did, but, but don't you feel that it's accumulation of things? Without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, you know, there's obviously a foundational um, uh, mental, whether it's a mental health issue um, or it's something that they're struggling with that they don't think that they're gonna be able to get past. Um, but let's face it, they, they see it as a means to an end. They see it as a permanent solution to a temporary problem, no matter how large that temporary problem is. 
How do you think that you could stop someone? Do you think that you can actually stop someone from committing suicide? I don't think you can stop somebody, no. No. If they want to do it, they're going to do it no matter what. Yeah, and the, the point of this film was that the hope is that enough people will see it, that if they are contemplating it, that maybe it will shock them to the core. See, my father thought that he thought of everything. He had insurance policies on the house. He had insurance policies on car loans. Back in the 80s, the insurance companies allowed this, and they paid out when you committed suicide. Now it would be a different story. But I would bet everything on my life that he never stopped to think who would find the body. So and he wouldn't have liked it that that was you. I was just pride and joy. So, right. But there must be suicide hotlines, right? Suicide prevention hotlines now, more than back then. How many years ago was this? 35, 35 years ago. But it's not a matter of whether there's enough suicide prevention lifelines or hotlines or advocacy groups. It's about talking about the issues that we have inside and not letting them bottle up. Because somebody most likely in experience from the research I've done, when people are ready to make that decision, it's too late for them to call for help. We have to get it early. We have to stop it before it becomes a decision that they have made. Well, good luck with your screening. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I noticed that you have a yellow ribbon. Yes, yellow is the color for suicide awareness, so that's why the bow tie and the uh, pocket square and the, the ribbon inside. Make sure that you have one, please. I will, I will. I'm here with Jonah Salander, and he is an award-winning director, and he was the director on 8. So, so nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. How are Good. you? Good. I wanted to ask you some questions. Now, how many, how long did it take you to shoot this? It was a five-day shoot. It was an extensive, very long days, but that, you know, we had a crew of people who really believed in this project. Right, and people right. really came into the story. And this is a short film, and what did you shoot it on? We shot it on a um, Canon. Yes. And uh, w was this shot in New York? No, we shot it on location in all along Long Island. It was shot in Long Island. Long Island, yes. And uh, what did you take out of your time filming this movie? How was it? I learned a lot from Steve Mason. He he shared a part of himself in making this film, and I think as a filmmaker, I came onto this project because it spoke to me. And I think there are projects that really need to speak to the heart. And so I, I learned that there is stuff that you have to leave behind to learn to be better. Now, did you ever have any kind of uh, experience with suicide in your family? Were you familiar at all? Yes, I am. Um, I have suffered from mental illness. I, I am, it's something close to my heart. It's something I believe in and something I work on. I think that if you're going to ask an actor to perform things, you have to know it. You have to be able to relate to it and understand it. So I, I, I saw, I didn't know Steve prior to this project. I saw in his Facebook post that it was a project that really needed to be told and was about something. We live in a world with so much media and so much going on that finding projects that mean something yeah. is really important. And, and not, not only mean something, that can actually change lives, right? Absolutely change lives. Yeah. And, and we've done a lot of work, outreach for suicide prevention. We have the ribbons on. It's something to discuss. There needs to be a conversation. There's such stigma attached to yeah. suicide. There is stigma. And, there is and there, we need to break through the stigma in order to... Now, this, this is a short film, so uh, is there any intention of making a feature length? I hope so. I would like to see it. You know, it's a story... The script started at 60 pages, and we really worked it down with all the themes and all things that were going on in the project to be more concise. But in a longer format, we'd be able to hit much more points that are of interest. Yeah. Now, uh, how was Steve to direct? Did he listen well? He is, yes, he's a very good person to work with. He has, he, he has had a vision of this project, and it was my goal to work with him to understand his vision and assist him and work with him as a co-director to, with the technical photography and working with him to establish his ideas. And it was really a wonderful experience. Congratulations. Looking forward. There's something wrong with Daddy. Is my husband going to jail? You're going to jail. You're going to jail. Officer, what were you thinking? Am I in trouble? Tony, he said everything is going to be fine. I don't think you get it. The way you treat me and ignore your son, you'd think that we were the ones who put you up for adoption. You know, you really need to think about what comes next for you in this life. I decided I'm not going to drink anymore. It's not worth it. 
I'm so proud of you. Thanks. Next, I'll show you what's fixed. I'm doing it with bread. And the fact that, you know, going to pick up a, a check from one of the executive producers, I was nervous because I had, you know, being an actor is one thing, but being a filmmaker is a completely different story. And to have the responsibility of taking somebody's money and, you know, being able to deliver a final product, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to start something that I couldn't finish. So, you know, I made sure that I was going to do it. But, you know, as I was going to pick up that check, I was, I had a few minutes and I had some anxiety and, you know, had now driving a car that my aunt had owned and I've had the car for, you know, a couple of years at that point or a year or whatever it was, been in and out of the car dozens and dozens of times and then all of a sudden on the, the, the floor mat is an original PBA card from 1982 that my dad had written to my aunt. It just gets better and better as the, as the stories went on. Uh, it, we needed that police station to be able to film that that you know, very real moment that, that I had spoken to my father's partner and he was the one that told me the story, how it happened. And the real story was that, um, to my understanding, they, they uh, pulled over a guy a couple weeks before Christmas and he, uh, they were gonna let him go. You know, they were highway patrol and it was, you know, the 80s. You drank and it was like, you know, just throw your keys down and take a nap for a half an hour and, and then drive home. But this guy was belligerent and wouldn't let up, so they ended up locking him up. And the story was that he got up, he was handcuffed sitting down in the chair and he went after a superior officer. And my dad instinctively pushed him down into the chair and the guy hit his head on the wall and probably was more embarrassed than he was hurt, but threatened to, you know, to sue the department and to take my dad's badge from him. You know, my dad wasn't, as you see, or, you know, these are the memories I had. They, you know, there were only a few and none of them were really that good. Um, but beside the fact of not being the greatest, maybe husband or father, he had a lot of pride in being a cop. And I don't know if, uh, if my family remembers, but I remember that after the, the wake they had handed us, and they could have done it for every officer that dies, who knows, but we felt special in the moment. They gave us this letter saying that he had the shiniest shoes and that, you know, his uniform was always uh, well-pressed and that, you know, he, he took a lot of pride in being an officer. And this thing is annoying. There we go. Um, and so when he thought that he was going to lose the one thing that meant something to him, it, you know, on top of finding out, and again, the, the story of him finding out when he was adopted, uh, I thought it was, originally when I wrote it, I thought it, it was when he was going to fill out the application for his, uh, to get married to my mother. And it turns out it was at a wedding that they were at that somebody recognized and was like, oh, that's so-and-so's kid, he's adopted, or, or to that extent. And that's how he found out. And, you know, being an adult and thinking that your parents are your parents and then to find that out, you know, plus he was in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, we just made mention for the fact that there were a lot of vets that, that suffered. Um, you know, I don't, my dad was in the Navy in the Vietnam War, but I don't know to what extent he came back and was affected. But I'm sure it had something to do with that. They, they adopted the adopted, the being a vet, um, obviously substance abuse and, and alcoholism and... You know, I, I said that it was mild yet inexcusable domestic violence. I, I don't know that he ever hit my mom, so to speak, but he did clear out the, the freezer one night and all this stuff was out onto the kitchen floor. And, you know, my mother, my mother was a very strong woman in the 80s to be able to take your kids out of the home and, and say, you know what, look, I'll put my feet on the ground and you're not going to do this. And, you know, truth be told, she took the gun from him when he said that he was going to, he was thinking about ending it all. It, it, in today's day, they, I, I don't know that a man would be strong enough to take it from his male partner or, you know, have, you know what I'm saying? I don't know that people would be strong enough to do what she did. And I give her a lot of credit back in the early 80s to be able to say, what? You, you know, you think of taking your life, I'm going to take it down there. And that's, you know, part of what was very important with Jonah and I going over through character development and all the characters in the story was, we had to find somebody that was able to, to pull that off. And Alex, you did a tremendous job. I love you.
the kids, the kids were, I, you, everybody who knows me knows kids are not my forte. However, the children in this film, they worked tirelessly. They were incredible. Uh, Jet, where are you, Jet? <laughs> Jet and Desi, Claire, and of course, where are you? Where's Elvira's daughter? Where is she, Jessica? Oh, right there. Stand up. This, I, I, you know, I, I'd be honest, all of the actors in this film have the, the potential to go very far. Just you're a special, a special young lady, and uh, I wish you the absolute best in your career, as everybody, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, I needed somebody that could play my sister, and she did it very well, and uh, I would like you to meet the real Christine before you leave, if you haven't already. Um, and... Lucille, who didn't get much recognition, but Lucille, Danielle, I love you. You've been everything to me ever since the film's been done, and I thank you, um, and I love you as well. So uh, it's just, it's every step of the way, there have been so many challenges, and you know, call it the, the negative side of the atom, call it the devil, call it whatever you will, um, versus the light or God or whatever you will in your life, but, um, I just know that I, I follow my heart to do the right thing and the universe has been gracious to give me all of the things and, and again, you know what, we, we put together a small movie and, and this is not, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it was amazing, I thought that I had processed all the emotions of this experience long, long ago. Uh, you know, truth be told, for those that don't know me, I went down the wrong road for a long time and was heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol many, many, many years. And it got worse and worse and to a point where I couldn't get high, I couldn't die. And uh, this actually, again, oddly enough, this will mark the eighth year that I'm clean in December. <laughs> Okay, and then, you know, again, this is just another thing to help people out with, you know, because I just want enough people to hear this story where they go, you know what, if that guy can do it, I can do it. I can make a movie. I can get clean. I can, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought that numbing myself was the right way to do it. And I've learned to embrace, like, I wanted, I, I was like, I was talking to Christy, I was like, I want a Xanax tonight because, you know, it's going to be 200 people clapping and yelling in my ear and I don't even want it. And I decided, I said, you know what? I said, no aid, no nothing, no headache medicine. I'm going to embrace every moment, whether people love it, hate it, or whatever, because there's a liberating feeling of being able to do it on my own with nothing. So, thank you. And, and you know, half of those people are clapping and we're going to get a drink after the leave here, so that's, um, to each his own. Uh, you know, if I was the type of person that could have one drink every once in a while, I just couldn't walk around without three or four vodkas in my hand at the same time. And, and I'm a better person, and Christy will tell you that I'm a better person, um, a better friend, a better lover, a better uh, partner, and... and uh, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> so anyway, that's that. Um, so I, what I, just to get it back to that, was I thought that I processed all the emotions to deal with this, and from the very first uh, moment that I started writing the script, I started hearing and I said, wow, I, I, I couldn't believe that that I hadn't processed it all. And then I cried tonight, the 66th time I watched the movie, and I'm still like, wow, you know, it takes, it's 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 an emotional topic, you know? I mean, the, these are things that I will never, and again, this is not an isolated story. You know, my story may be a little unique in, in the way that I, I found my father dead, but there are a lot of people that, that find even worse and go through worse and that are going through worse. And it's not about me. This film is an effort to get people to talk about these things. To go, you know what? I'm effed up. I don't feel right. I'm, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. Help me. And, and before it gets too late. You know, they have these... Thank you. I knew, I knew that my, my father was trained by... Uh, his name was an angel. I changed it. Um, but... He was, a. they were in highway patrol, and I wasn't sure the terminology that they would have used in the car and what their titles would have been as far as uh, desk sergeant and staff sergeant and squad sergeant. So um, we reached out, we were lucky enough. I have a few friends who I grew up with that turned into police officers, and Uncle Mike is part of the probation department, and through him and, and uh, he and Courtney, I should say, they had some uh, police officers, friends of the family that uh, helped 
consult uh, to let a film crew in there before, so they were a little reluctant, but after begging and pleading, they allowed us to film, and it turned out that that probation department, before it was a probation department, was a police station. And what are the chances that that was the police station that my father worked in? The sixth precinct in the morning, yeah. So it was amazing that you, you couldn't make it up. You really couldn't. And that's the first time I told that story without like shaking and getting into tears because when they locked the door of the police station and opened it up the next day as a probation department, they didn't change a damn thing. The desks were from the 80s, the cork boards. We went in there, it was like, wow. We were like kids in a candy store. We're like, we didn't, we, We'll use that room, or that room, or that room, or, th or this room. Any room you'll give us, we'll use. And so it was. Uh, it was a great. It was a great experience. Um, I don't know where I. I love that part of the story. That and the other thing is, I don't know if anybody noticed. At the end, that last scene when, when they were doing the the paper route, I was needed on another location, so I wasn't there when they filmed it. And uh, when the camera pulled back and revealed the number on the mailbox that was number eight. I'm like, did you put that in there? He's like, I didn't even see it, Steve. I wasn't even paying attention. Like my house is, that I live in now is four digits. Maybe you have two digits, maybe you have one digit. What are the chances if you did it you know, numerically, what are the chances that it would be eight? Mm. Kind of freaky, you know, I mean, kind of freaky. <laughs> so uh, it was things like that that just kept telling me to go forward and keep pushing and complete this project. And uh, God, anybody on Facebook knows that I had better had finished the project I was talking about for so long. You know, telling everybody to either contribute to the cause or to come watch it. Or and uh, and again, I'm so 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 appreciative for each and every one of you guys. Um, and if there's any other questions, we'll answer quick. But if not, we're gonna wrap it up. And uh, yeah, everybody wants to wrap up. Yeah.